Other than guns, the vets brought back some really interesting things. And today, I'm gonna to show you one. So we got this in about two weeks ago and I wasn't sure what to do with it other than I did want to show it to you guys in a video uh, because this canister, what does it contain? We're going to open it up, not for the first time, but we are going to open it up and inside is a German parachute in unissued condition. I asked myself, why the heck did he send this home? He actually, this is not a bring back, but this is a mail back. Now I know the vets uh, could send mail home for free. Uh, they could also send packages home uh, fairly cheap, but this is over 50 pounds and it's a big canister. Uh, again, we're going to open it up a little bit and he sent it home, I assume, to a family member and the address is on here. But the uh, soldier was Sergeant Andrew Jarris and he was in the 44th Armored uh, Battalion, actually the medical department there. So he probably worked with the corpsmen and the doctors and nurses, uh, but in the 44th armored battalion um, and he was part of Patton's army that really led the juggernaut all the way from the breakout in Normandy uh, until they got to uh, southern Germany. I think they ended up in uh, Munich area or uh, Czechoslovakia but they also went through Bastogne and it was in one of those uh, very late battles in 1945 that three of the guys that were in his uh, battalion, three of them each picked up one of these and they mailed them home. So we're gonna take a closer look at that and uh, come on over and check this out. So the gentleman that brought us this actually did a lot of research and found out that there were three sent over all from the 44th Battalion, medical, uh, the medical department, medical corps. Uh, this first one is a Corporal Wallace Polmanter. So Corporal Wallace Polmanter, this is the one he sent home uh, and looks like that one may have been opened. And then this is the other one, uh, Sergeant Mack, also uh, same uh, division. All three of the guys used uh, their um, army post address, even though they were in the European theater. Uh, th I believe this is an army post address that they used, uh, but they all sent it. This looks like it went to a miss somebody in Illinois and I can't really read where this one went, but you can see on this one that this is from, and that's their army post, and it is going to uh, Mrs. Anna, I think it's Peterson, and she is in Wheeling, West Virginia. You also see one stamp with Woodrow Wilson on it, and that's a $1 stamp. It looks like there was another here, so it cost at least $2 to send this home, so, you know, that, it's not that that was a lot of money in th those days, but he must have really wanted it. Now, the, the German writing on here, and by the way, we're going to see several places where uh, he had the address. He wanted to make sure it got there. Uh, but also, it said it was inspected and approved by the U.S. Army. So the Army inspected it before it went over. I presume they're trying to stop people from sending over machine guns and things, but that still happened, as we know, because there's a lot, there were a lot of unregistered machine guns that came back to the United States, and now uh, some of them have been registered and they're legally transferred. You can see the model number. This is actually an RZ-20. The RZ-20 was a parachute that was an improvement after the Crete campaign. Now, Crete was the first time that the German army, and as far as I know, any army, did a full-scale assault uh, using paratroopers. Uh, it didn't go as successfully as they wanted, and there was a few things that went wrong. One of the things that went wrong was the design of the parachute. Uh, once they landed on the ground, it was hard to get the parachute off. Sometimes they had to cut it off. Um, it just They struggled to get the parachute off, and so this is an improvement. I will actually show you this because I'm going to put it on. Um, also, it is dated. Uh, if we turn this, you can see right here, there's the maker and the date is 1944. So this was made late war. And the reason these are still in the canisters, I, I, again, I did a little bit of research and the gentleman that brought this to me did a little bit of research. Uh, the reason I think they were still in the canisters is by 1944, the Luftwaffe uh, didn't have enough transport uh, planes to uh, mount a full-scale paratrooper 
assault. So the paratroopers were assigned to some of the elite troops at the end of the war, uh, the Battle of, of Bastogne, there were paratroopers, uh, and then as, peop as they crossed the Rhine and came into Germany, all the troops were pulled up to the front, including paratroopers. So they weren't necessarily needing the parachutes anymore because they had no, uh, they had planes, they had transport planes, I'm not saying there were none, but they didn't have enough to mount an assault. And that's why these were laying around in a canister and three of them sent back to the United States. Let's op open up this sucker. Pops up. Excellent condition. One of the things that I noticed when I opened it up, there's no smell of mildew or it's not, it doesn't have a musty smell. This is in pristine condition. Uh, here is again the address. You can see here it's upside down for you, but it's passed by an inspector. It says Army Examiner. Uh, they also cer said certificate enclosed. So it was inspected and approved. And here is the address. Uh, well, that's the from address in New York. And then this is the to address. Once we lift this up, we can see the insides, but this is a like a duffel bag. I'm gonna try to lift this up. Now the parachute itself weighs just under 50 pounds. It's about 48 pounds. And it lifts right out, and you can look into the canister. Nothing exciting, but that's, uh, that's the way it looks. Now we take this and open it up and there's the parachute itself like i said it's unissued it's unissued never been used um, i'm going to put it on in a minute but i want to show you a couple things that those of you who are in germany or speak german uh, there's one of the tags and also the buckles every one of them has a luftwaffe proof so every one of the buckles will have this little luftwaffe proof which is the l2 proof uh, you also see that L2 proof on some of their equipment. Most notably, I just happened to have a 1940 Krigoff, and you see that first proof right there. It's the L2 proof. Also, uh, we get the paratrooper uh, gravity knives. Uh, we sell, we've sold them. I don't have one right now, but um, as you pull the knife out, you can see the little L2 proof. We've also had holsters with the L2 proof. Uh, the Krigoff holsters went to the paratroopers. Uh, let's see, the paratroopers are most notable. Uh, one of the things that's most recognizable is their oddly shaped helmet. It's not odd for them, but it's unusual for a German uniform. And then uh, the other most notable weapon that comes to mind is the FG-42, which was developed for the Luftwaffe after the Battle of Crete. Let's talk about the Battle of Crete a little bit. And, and then I'm gonna try on this parachute and jump off the roof. So hang in there. So this picture I don't think is from the Battle of Crete, but this is the um, parachute. It's again, the RZ-1 uh, or RZ-16 was used in Crete, but then the improvement was the RZ-20, and that's what I'm gonna be putting on. I can't tell which one that is, but I can recognize these straps. This is as they're loading up because they have their parachutes on. Uh, that's the helmet I was mentioning to you. And then you'll notice right here, this black holster, I believe would be a Krigoff because they were issued to the paratroopers. They also are notable for their blousey pants. Um, I can guess at what that would be, but I'll let somebody comment. I'll bet there are people out there that know a lot more about this. And there's a paratrooper that is in Crete. And what I notice right here, do you see that? That's, a, uh, that's definitely a Luger. Can't say for sure it's a Krigoff, but that's a Luger in his belt with no holster. And then unfortunately he's carrying a K98. And that was one of the problems. There's several problems in Crete. I already mentioned they didn't like the design of the parachute because it didn't have a quick release. So that was an improvement that was made. Also the canopy tended to be white. And so for aerial troops trying to spot where the troops were, the white parachutes on the ground were a dead giveaway as to where they had landed. Uh, so this parachute that I have now uh, is most likely, it's not, never been opened and I'm not going to open it because they tell me it's more valuable in unopened condition. But if we opened it, it's most likely camouflaged because they said the majority, after Crete, the majority were camouflaged. Uh, the other thing that happened is they didn't have the right equipment. The equipment was dropped separately and they were far from their equipment. And so the first day of the Battle of Crete, they lost 4,000 paratroopers. So it was almost a stunning loss for the uh, German Luftwaffe, 
but uh, the next day they kind of turned things around and eventually uh, won the battle for Crete. Uh, however, Hitler was very upset about the losses and they never really, they had other campaigns, paratrooper campaigns, smaller operations, but they never had a large um, military uh, invasion using pa paratroopers, although as we know, um, the United States and England did. I wanted to mention this one picture as well. You can see this is Crete, and he's carrying an uh, MG34. And you can see the size of the bullets, and, the, and we know I've picked those up, and they are extremely heavy. Um, and so it was cumbersome for them to be uh, rapid striking, uh, jump from a parachute with your weapon in hand. That was too cumbersome. And so after the uh, Battle of Crete and some of the losses they had there, uh, they came up, the Luftwaffe had the FG-42 design. We have sold them only in semi-automatic, but if you find a full automatic, they can easily be $100,000 or more. But the FG-42 uh, came out of uh, some of the losses that they had in the Battle of Crete. Okay, so uh, Randy helped me get this on my back. Like I said, it's actually 48 pounds or so the literature says. This is the design of the new buckle. Um, it's not important about snapping it. What's important is unsnapping it. So now this is a little small on me, but mostly because I have a massive chest and that's from working out so much. Either that or I eat too much. Okay, so the problem was these were hard to get off. Uh, oh, by the way, I might as well go ahead and do the rest of it. Okay, just like putting on a life vest, by the way, I went on a cruise recently and we had to put on our life vest. This goes under your leg. This one snaps on. Getting a little hot in here. This one, on the other leg. I'm doing this to show you not how to get them on. But the improvement here, if I'm huffing and puffing, that's just because I'm in great shape. The improvement here was once they got to the ground, or if you're, you've seen them hanging in a tree and they have to cut it, all you do is push this button, push this button. Beautiful. So that was the improvement they made on these. This, of course, this is a lot harder. This is a little more complicated because it takes two actions. Push that in and then that goes in. And that hooks on the line. And you see in the movies they hook on and then they go down and jump. And then that will pull and open the chute. Now this also has the original key, which I think is your backup reserve. We'll take a look at that and also some of the markings on here, which tells us a little bit more about what this was used for. So when this gets pulled, uh, there's what they call the key, and I assume that eventually pulls this. And they said it, this is, it has the original seal on it, so it's never been used. Uh, the other thing that I noticed is the HE-111. If you know uh, anything about Luftwaffe planes, you know that this was used for uh, light, as a light bomber or a transport plane, uh, especially for paratroopers. But earlier than that, I think it's the Hinkle 111, and then there's the Junkers. Uh, in the United States, it looks like Junkers, but it's the Junkers 52. The Junker 52 was used in Crete for transporting, and there's actually pictures of the paratroopers being uh, dropped from that plane or this plane. But surprisingly, the plane is right there. Surprisingly, this is all completely intact. Um, and I don't know much about these. This is the first time I've ever seen one and held one, and uh, we will be selling it. I looked online, and I found one that was not in as good a condition, and it was on, online for over $5,000, so they go for a lot of money. I have no idea what they're worth, but we will be selling this one. Okay, whoever gets the uh, parachute will get some of this research that uh, the, the owner, uh, we're selling it on consignment, but the owner gave us some of this information. He typed up uh, some of the history. He did some research on the 44th Armored Battalion. Uh, this is what is written on the outside of the container. Also, this was uh, Andrew uh, Jarris, and the uh, that was his uh, return address, and that was the address of the woman who uh, received the package from him. These are three uh, parachute divisions that they ran into, Patton's Army, the Third Army, these are the Second, the Third, and the Fifth uh, uh, Parachute Division. So they were fighting paratroopers, even though they, they had not uh, parachuted into the battlefield. 
And then finally, these are the other two. Remember I said there was three. I, sh I showed you pictures of these two, these two. Um, and this is the uh, typed out so you can see it more plainly. There's the way the addresses, they use white paint and it looks like they all use the same white paint. And here it is right here uh, where you can see his return address and then the address of Anna Peterson in Wheeling, West Virginia. Okay, so that was some uh, interesting history about the war. I learned something about parachutes and paratroopers, um, but now I'm going to move on to collecting guns again. But some of you out there don't collect guns. You collect some of these other items. This is certainly a high-end, unusual, I would say museum-quality piece that was brought back from the war. It's going to be a bear to ship. So if you're, if you're near me and, and come, can come pick this up, I would love it. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe to our channel because we have more coming real soon.